Everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Stephen Mills is the author of Chosen, a memoir of stolen boyhood. It's a story about the lifelong ramifications of childhood sexual abuse. The abuser held a position of authority and trust with Stephen, his family, and the entire community. For years, the violence Stephen had experienced plagued him. This bright and promising young man veered off on a path of drug use and petty crime. In an attempt to escape his memories, Stephen fled to Asia and into a Vietnamese refugee camp in Cambodia. But the memories traveled with him. This is an incredibly moving story about courage and resilience. On the back cover of Stephen's book is a quote from Marcy Hamilton. In this game-changing memoir, Stephen Mills draws the reader into a boy's and then a man's journey through the wilderness of trauma. Beautifully written and deeply moving, Chosen elevates the survivor story to an Odyssean trek to reclaim one's soul. Please welcome Stephen Mills to Bump in the Road. Welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, let's talk a little bit about the first part of your story. Sure. Uh, My book, Chosen, it's uh, in three parts. And the first part is my recounting uh, the childhood sexual abuse Um, I suffered starting at age 13, and it really does that through the eyes of the boy. I felt that was really important to do so that people could understand what this experience is. Of course, the experience of child sexual abuse is, uh, you know, sadly very pervasive and common. Uh, It's some one out of 10 boys and girls uh, experience childhood sexual abuse. And... um, and the numbers for boys may be as high as one in six, according to many studies. So um, this is a very, this happens to millions and millions of us, and yet there's very little written, especially by men, about what the experience is as a boy. And I wanted to try to capture that without jargon, without hindsight, without looking back and interrupting the story, but just to tell the story through the child's eyes. And so uh, what happened to me was at age 13, um, I was from a Jewish family. I'd just been bar mitzvahed. I was going off to my Jewish summer camp uh, for the third time. And uh, there was a new director that summer uh, who, by the name of Daniel Farinella, a very revered social worker um, in Jewish camping circles uh, and in high schools where he was a social work counselor. Uh, And out of nowhere, uh, he made it clear he wanted to be my friend and took me on this walk and asked about my family and started talking about um, sex and masturbation, you know, kind of strange things. But of course, this was like the hand of God reaching down, you know, the, the director of a summer camp is kind of like your principal in school, right? You don't talk to this person. Uh, uh, unless you're in trouble and called to their office. So the fact that he was choosing me uh, was, you know, kind of unreal. Um, You know, I I felt incredibly special. And uh, that summer, uh, he, what we would call today grooming, he really spent the summer grooming me. Uh, And and this is, I felt it was really important to get into this in some detail because while grooming is a very common term thrown around today, most people think of it as um, a, when a an abuser buys gifts for a kid or gives them money, takes them to the movie, maybe there's some physical boundary violations. All of those things are true, but really the core of grooming is much more emotional and psychological, and it's the predator building a relationship of trust with a child that is very, very deep uh, and uh, is so profound by the time the trap springs shut, when the abuse begins, um, 
you know, the, the boy or girl is completely powerless and of course, deeply betrayed, you know, by what this authority figure is doing. And that's what happened to me. The grooming went on for the summer, that fall, uh, this man got my mother's permission to take me away to uh, camp in the off season where essentially it was just him and me a hundred miles from home in the middle of the woods and he sexually assaulted me. And that, uh, that led into this next phase of, I mean, I was utterly um, confused and um, terrified and uncomprehending about what this was, you know, to, as adults, we look at this and think, oh, sexual abuse, it's about sex. But from the child's point of view, it has nothing to do with sex. It's power and control and violence. Um, and in my case, as I described in the book, a near-death experience, I was out of my body watching the whole scene from above as if it were someone else's body. So that, um, that began a two-year period of repeated sexual abuse. And um, part one ends when I'm 15 uh, and I stop going to camp uh, and the abuse ends. And um, I am also at that point trying to come to terms with these memories of my father that are coming up because I had lost my father just before I turned five. And, and this is part of what this abuser was um, turning to his advantage. He tend to pray, and this is not unusual, preyed on boys who were either fatherless or came from broken homes or had troubled relationships with the father or both parents. Uh, and that's one of the themes in the book is this reemergence of my father and my psyche uh, and you know just how central that was to my ultimately unraveling of what had happened to me. One of the things that I really like about your book is that it's divided into three parts. The first part where you talk about your experience as a young man, which you call predation, and the second part called flight. And the part um, that deals with flight, oh my gosh, I think it resonates with all of us in so many ways. Tell that part of the story a bit. Yeah, so flight is really, I mean, in today's terms, you know, we we say PTSD, right? This is trauma manifesting itself in my young adult life. Um, in my early 20s, having not seen this, uh, you know, this abuser for many years, I discovered that he was molesting boys in a different state. And, um, and I tried confronting him. I did confront him. Uh, ultimately, it didn't change his behavior. But unlike everyone else around him, I did confront him. And uh, the failure of that, and also the failure of my own denial for years as a teenager, I was so dissociated from what had happened to me, which of course is very common. It was living in my body, but my body wasn't sharing it with my conscious mind. Uh, so I knew it had happened, but we we need to get up and live and survive. That's what nature prepares us for. And so we push this stuff aside. It kind of freezes in our body. Uh, and when I discovered he was molesting boys, it was I could no longer deny what had happened to me. And so all of the emotional energy that had gone into suppressing that just exploded out of this kind of Pandora's box. And of course, I was overwhelmed. I had no psychological help. I had no therapeutic support. I had never told anyone. Uh, and so I really, uh, this part two called flight is my unraveling. It was kind of a spectacular meltdown. I was on my way to a PhD program in economics at the University of Wisconsin uh, in 1978 when I made this discovery that he was molesting boys. And within a matter of months after discovering that and my denial cracking, I had dropped out of this PhD program. I was shooting drugs. I was involved in petty crime and, and trying to disappear myself, quite literally. And so that was a kind of a four year slow motion train wreck until I hit bottom and had a physical and mental breakdown. Uh, and, um, th that is, that's where part two ends is this kind of collapse. Uh, and, and then part three begins a, 
a different uh, phase of the story in which I kind of claw my way back. Your path, though, was really spectacular, I have to say. Um, going to India, ending up in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, that's an incredible saga just there. Yes, it was, and very random. A actually, a Vietnamese boat person camp in southern Thailand. Um, and um, it was, I had really fled to Southeast Asia with a friend of mine because I could no longer, I'd been arrested, I'd had suicide attempts. I, I realized there was some inner wisdom saying, you need to get out of the country, you need to get as far as you can from what's happening. And uh, Asia seemed as far as I could get. And uh, in Asia, I had another drug overdose, but somehow I wound up in this refugee camp, which was, uh, this was at the height of the boat person uh, exodus from Vietnam in 1980, 81. And it was actually a remarkable moment in history because it, it was the largest exodus by sea in human history. You know, more than a million uh, Vietnamese had fled the new communist regime in Vietnam. And... Um, some 20% of them didn't survive the voyage and the rest wound up in these camps up and down the coast of Thailand and Malaysia. And I was working in one of these camps volunteering and still in the midst of this physical mental collapse. And I made so many wonderful friends there uh, amongst the Vietnamese refugees who really took me in. I mean, it was pretty ironic. I was, I was here were these refugees who had just been devastated and so many of the women had been raped and were traumatized themselves. And they took me in and, you know, cared for me. And of course I was teaching English and helping them out, but it was sort of a mutual, a mutual aid society. Uh, and I'm, I'm still very close with uh, many of them today. Do you uh, keep in touch with Mrs. Pham? I do not. Um, I, I don't know what happened to her. And yeah, she's a, she was a Vietnamese soothsayer uh, who who is rather dramatically at one point in the camp um, reads both my past and my future. I'd never met her before. I mean, a friend, a, ph a Vietnamese philosophy professor, took me to her to get my palm read, and you know, she told me things that I don't know. I have no explanation for it, but she, uh, she and and she very much framed her reading of my life in. Vietnamese terms, meaning she, she, what she said was, "There's an evil spirit chasing you," and I, you know, that's about as good an explanation as I have for, you know, we'd call it, you know, trauma or PTSD and, uh, you know, childhood sexual abuse, you know, that had been stalking me since age thirteen. She called it the evil spirit, and and in retrospect, that's a pretty damn good um, name, you know, for for what it was, as I would find out just a few years later when I really came face to face with what had happened to me and, and what was stalking me. I mean, both physically, psychologically, spiritually, um, it was an evil spirit. When you look back on that, um, did your experience with her kind of change your sense of what's reality? I mean, it's incredible that she was able to read that off your palm. And I think that there are a lot of things uh, that we run into that may not make sense in our Western world, but have great import in other cultures. Yeah, that's right. And you know, we put, we place a lot of stock in rationalism and science, and I'm I absolutely place stock in those things too. But of course, there's so much in the nature of the universe and our lives that are simply not explainable in material terms. I mean, physics recognizes this, of course. There's just great mysteries underlying everything. And I do think there are people like her who are tapped into those mysteries and, and somehow able to peer into whatever the reality is in, in someone's history and psychology and energy to see what's going on. Uh, and it, it, I can't say that it, it would take me years to really understand or appreciate what she had told me. It wasn't like a light bulb went off and I said, oh, okay, I get it. Now I need to do this. It was more, she, it was, um, she gave me some framework that would serve me later in, in understanding what I was facing, what I was up against. How many people were in this camp? 
about 5,000, a max five to 7,000. And, and it was only the size of a football field. It, it was crammed. It was crammed, you know, 20 porta potties. And, but as I say in the book, the Vietnamese are masters of the orderly village. I mean, it was, I, it was, uh, I was always horrified to think about, you know, 5,000 Americans crammed into a football field. You know, it was not a pretty picture, but, <laughs> you know, they, they really kept a, and ran a very orderly, um, for the most part, peaceable um, place. What did you do there? I was teaching English uh, to because virtually everyone who had fled Vietnam in a boat was um, looking to resettle in the West. You know, the United States was the number one choice, or the Freedom Land, as they called it. They didn't call it the U.S. They called it the Freedom Land, uh, or uh, Western Europe. You know, France, England, and some to Australia. And so, their number one um, need was to learn English. So that's what I was doing, helping teach them English. For some reason, that scene from Good Morning Vietnam comes to mind. Yeah, right. With Robin Williams, you know, teaching English and everybody just having a hoot over the whole thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, we were, it was, it was desperate times, you know, but very, um, the Vietnamese place a huge um, emphasis on education. And so, I mean, I, I could have a hundred people in a class and they went, they spanned, you know, ages five to 90. I mean, and they were, took it very, very seriously. You know, they prepared, they studied, they came with their little pink tie notebooks and took notes and, um, you know, really hung on every word because they just they understood how important language was going to be uh, into their journey in America. And of course, looking back now, uh, because I stay in touch with Vietnamese and certain Vietnamese American communities here, they've been so successful and just the, their edu the priority of education and entrepreneurialism has served them so well uh, in America. Want to hear more of the conversation? Sign up at bumpintheroad.us as a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. You can give it a go for free. Just use the code FREEMONTH. And thank you for listening today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. <laughs>